30% of the population has in increased triglycerides, but there's a small group of people that have severe hypertriglyceridemia. And actually, severe hypertriglyceridemia is not associated with atherosclerosis, but especially uh, pancreatitis. And I think it's one of the biggest challenges that we as lipidologists, GPs, endocrinologists have in order to treat the patients and to prevent the risk of pancreatitis. This has been one of the most uh, complex areas to manage uh, severe chylomicronemia. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the sequelae of con of co or consequences of uh, uh, severe hypertriglyceridemia or extreme uh, hypertriglyceridemia, and I'd probably better define that as uh, a, a fasting plasma concentration on three occasions, mm -hmm. about 880 milligrams per deciliter or 10 millimoles per liter, that is refractory to conventional therapies. Um, that is to say, diet and uh, a a agents such as fibrates and omega-3 fatty acids and possibly niacin, the lower triglycerides. So this is a persistent uh, chylomicronemia or persistent hypertriglyceridemia above 10 millimoles per litre, 880 milligrams per deciliter that's present uh, for a long period of time, almost persistently. And classically, that's due to a rare autosomal recessive uh, condition, called, uh, which is a biallelic uh, uh, gene defect in five canonical genes that impair the clearance of uh, chylomicrons from the circulation. In other words, the fat that you eat that enters the circulation has to be cleared by the enzyme lipoprotein lipase. And uh, when you have this conditional familial chylomicronemia syndrome, uh, you have two alleles, one from one parent and one from the other, that's not working. And therefore the machinery for clearing triglycerides and chylomicrons specifically is impaired. So the, the sequelae are, are, quite, um, uh, are, are quite disturbing really. In its extreme form uh, is acute pancreatitis, mm -hmm. which can be life-threatening uh, and affects uh, quality of life. Uh, but also there are other consequences, uh, sort of uh, emotional consequences of having severe hypertriglyceridemia and the fear of pancreatitis and uh, non-specific abdominal pain, uh, as well as uh, you know cognitive abnormalities because the severe chylomicronemia can also lead to brain fogging and um, uh, other other cognitive abnormalities. So it really has you know an effect. Uh, throughout uh, the, it's a systemic effect, but the main one that, um, that can kill patients is um, uh, hemorrhagic pancreatitis, and which can be recurrent to, uh, leading to recurrent hospital admissions. Um, chylomicronemia of this sort of order that we're talking about uh, is, uh, is the third most common cause of acute pancreatitis, but it is the form of pancreatitis that has the worst prognosis, with average length of stays in hospital of up to uh, 10 days. And it, it, it's, it's been a major gap uh, in care. Uh, let's just go back a second and talk about the etiology. Uh, primarily, it's due to familial chylomicronemia syndrome, which is not a very common mm -hmm. disorder. Its frequency is similar to homozygous FH, so there'd be of the order of uh, 10,000 patients throughout the world, uh, which is not a lot, really, you know, but it's a very rare condition with a very high morbidity and mortality. But there is another condition that simulates it, um, that masquerades as familial combined, so as familial chylomicronemia syndrome, and that's uh, multifactorial chylomicronemia syndrome. We can't really genetically test everyone. Genetic testing is not available. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if, if, if the diagnosis of these conditions, particularly FCS, has to rely on a genetic test, uh, uh, there wouldn't be equity, you know, throughout the world, really. So, I mean, it's almost, in my opinion, you know, um, a better approach, really, which was an approach that was adopted in the Palisade trial, is to use a definition that is a clinical definition, a phenotypic de definition of persistent uh, persistent uh, chylomicronemia, persistent hypertriglyceridemia, 
Um, and I think that's a more equitable uh, approach, really. And, and I think a, a, a good hint for, for the clinicians is that actually these patients are usually refractory to the usual therapies that... Correct. Right? So Palisade is about uh, an agent, uh, that a new agent, a first-in-class agent, that actually meets that treatment gap in the management of severe persistent color microneemia and acute pancreatitis. Independently of the genetics of the patient, right? Independent of the, uh, yeah. of the genetics, really. And patients yeah. for this particular trial were selected with a clinical diagnosis, uh, but you could have a genetic test. Uh, and that was, in, in fact, uh, a, um, a uh, advice, really, given by the regulators. Mm -hmm. Quite correctly so, so that, you know, to increase, as it were, the more, a broader approach to managing the disorder and not to get to honed in with a genetic diagnosis that's not freely available. Mm -hmm. So Palisade uh, meets, uh, the trial was designed to, to test the hypothesis, if you wish, in a, in a double-blind randomized controlled trial, that if you administered um, plazaciran, which is um, first-in-class sRNA, uh, that, as it were, shoots the messenger for the mRNA or APOC3, mm -hmm. uh, whether this could reduce triglycerides as the primary endpoint uh, at 10 months, plasma triglycerides, in people uh, selected for having persistent chylomicronemia. Uh, persistent chylomicronemia defined as, um, uh, well, it was defined as uh, plasma concentration of triglycerides uh, greater than 1,000 milligrams mm -hmm. per deciliter, no more than about 11.3 on about three occasions. With a previous, with a with either a biallelic gene defect, if available, if not, uh, a history of acute pancreatitis, family history of hypertriglyceridemia, or admissions to hospital with a recurrent abdominal pain, um, where all other causes had been excluded. So it's a very strong clinical definition. About 90% of these individuals, 60% of them had had um, biallelic gene defects, either homozygotes or compound heterozygotes. Um, and the other 40, 45% or so really did not. So come back to why are we choosing APOC3 and not anything else? Well, APOC3, as you quite correctly said, the genome-wide association studies and the Mendelian randomization studies actually do testify that it lowers triglycerides. Uh, it also lowers your risk of coronary heart disease. Mm -hmm. But we do know that APOC3 is, as it were, a negative regulator of uh, triglyceride metabolism. What do I mean by that? Well, it actually inhibits uh, the enzyme lipoprotein lipase, um, and it also r inhibits the uh, lip lipoprotein lipase, the LPL independent pathway, specifically by inhibiting the uptake of remnants, you know, via the chylomicron remnant in the LDL receptor pathway. Additionally, it also probably inhibits hepatic lipase. So it's something that you don't want around when you've got uh, chylomicronemia. So the object is where you can shoot it, as it were, you know, shoot, shoot the messenger, that's the sort of metaphor that we use, and your APOC3 concentrations fall, then you can reverse that abnormality, actually, and it seemed to work quite well. It seemed to work uh, whether you had uh, biallelic gene defects or you didn't have biallelic mm. gene defects, independent of that, it worked well, and we think it works well. Well, certainly in those without a biallelic gene defect by, as it were, derepressing some residual lipoprotein lipase activity, but also in both groups by allowing the, um, the large color micron remnants and the VLDL remnants to be cleared by the LDL receptor independent pathway. But that was the mechanism that we thought independent of whether you had biallelic gene defects, you had a commensurate reduction in plasma triglycerides as well. And the primary endpoint, which was the plasma triglyceride level at um, median level at, at 10 months, you know, fell by 80%. Wow, really. that's amazing. Yeah, and, it, you know, the effect, uh, the effect that you got from administering as a double-blind randomized controlled trial quarterly administration uh, subcutaneously in people who were already on dietary treatment and drug treatment. And I'll come back to that. This is really quite important, a point of difference with other trials, actually, uh, because the placebo group in this group did remarkably well, actually. And mm -hmm. despite the reduction in triglycerides in the placebo group, really, the, that plus the intervention actually produced an even greater reduction in plasma triglycerides, a very rapid reduction within the first uh, uh, few weeks and sustained out to 12 months. 
So by contrast to other trials in the field, if you look at the placebo group and other trials that have been done, uh, where the plasma, plasma triglycerides go up in placebo. And this actually. one, where they went down? Well, this one they went oh, down. Okay. I was really pleased about that because of what it really meant to me, really, this was an ethically conducted trial where, you know, even placebo group patients were obtaining some benefit. But despite that, you know, you know there was an increased uh, uh, odds, uh, there was an increased odds, there were five cases of acute pancreatitis in the group, in that particular group, uh, versus two in the combined group. But the, the relative odds, and it was not the primary endpoint, the relative odds of uh, developing uh, pancreatitis uh, was uh, was decreased significantly by 83 yeah, percent. This is this this is fantastic. Highly highly significant. Yeah. But it appears really that there was an improvement in uh, in quality of life really in those mm -hmm. receiving uh, uh, plazacirin. The important thing to say is that the the treatment strategy for patients with chylomicronemia, aside from what we've said really, is to to give them the, the usual care of low-fat diet, uh, vitamin D supplementation, medium-chain triglycerides, uh, statins. If, if Statins, there is a role for them, particularly for those who may be at risk of coronary heart disease with diabetes, and um, and uh, and fibrates. Uh, uh, was that uh, with the intervention, really, there was about 50% of people reached the the goal of less than uh, five millimoles per liter, 500 milligrams per deciliter, and over 75% of patients achieved. Uh, the treatment goal of less than 10 millimoles per liter, 8, 80 milligrams per deciliter. That's what's in. That's what the re that's what the recommendation is. You know, the recommendation is drop uh, in the guidelines. Drop your triglycerides by uh, at least 50 percent, and then go for 50. Um, go, go for um, 10 millimoles per liter, um, 8, 80 milligrams per deciliter, or 50 millimoles per liter, 500 milligrams per deciliter as a second objective. Uh, and that was seen uh, with this uh, intervention. And, and, this, and, and Gerald, the, the response to therapy was independent of the genetic defect, right? Yes, it was independent of the genetic defect, really. Whether you had a biallelic uh, mut mutation with no lipoprotein lipase activity by implication, or whether you had some residual lipoprotein lipase activity, implying that it, and I think we've got to study this further, that the primary mechanism of action is probably by an LPL independent mm -hmm. pathway, actually. So, uh, uh, Jerry, can you talk a little bit about the possible adverse events of the therapy? Because it was well tolerated, right? Uh, Exceptionally well tolerated. Yeah. Um, uh, in fact, there was uh, more adverse events than placebo, actually, you know than the intervention group. And that is because the placebo patients develop acute pancreatitis mm -hmm. and had to be withdrawal, greater, greater rate of withdrawal. Um, the early signal was uh, a suggestion of hyperglycemia mm -hmm. uh, with the intervention that uh, was not sustained. And uh, in my opinion, what I call it is probably a storm in a teacup. Mm -hmm. And, and probably this occurred more in people already had hyper di diabetes or it tended to manifest uh, yeah. in people who had pre-diabetes or established no. diabetes. So we're talking about people with severe refractory hypertriglyceridemia with recurrence of pancreatitis. And now you have a therapy that is really robust in reducing triglycerides and preventing pancreatitis, and independently of the genetic yeah. defect, right? It would be like that. Yeah, so, you know, the, the Palisade trial uh, demonstrated that plazacirin, you know, re significantly met uh, its primary endpoint by reducing plasma triglycerides by over 80% to 10 months. Uh, and uh, reduced the incidence of pan pancreatitis by 83%, and it did this uh, in a very efficacious and safe manner. So uh, it's now, you know, it's been, gi been given uh, FDA fast tracking, uh, and uh, it's now being uh, reviewed by the FDA as a uh, new drug application. But what about the possibility of uh, of plazacirin uh, could reduce the risk of atherosclerosis, coronary heart disease? Because you know triglyceride-rich lipoproteins are associated with a greater risk of coronary heart disease. But so far, we have not real robust evidence that really taking away the VLDLs maybe 
not a big color Marx, but the remnants will prevent the risk of events. What do you think about it? Yeah, well, you know, uh, I think it's very encouraging. I think you've been in a publication that will appear in the European Heart Journal uh, using a mixture of cohort studies, uh, drug uh, um, uh, individuals in, in a number of uh, uh, drug trials too, uh, that uh, have generated the notion that the, we probably might have had the range of triglycerides wrong for the uh, triglyceride intervention trials. And by that, by that I mean choosing people between two and five millimoles per liter. Because when you look at the epidemiological studies, uh, the risk of coronary heart disease increases actually dramatically between five and ten millimoles per so liter. So five and ten, we're talking about four four hundred and fifty. Yeah, five hundred to uh, yeah, eight hundred and eighty yeah, milligrams per deciliter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so I think there is. Uh, I think it needs to be tested, uh, but the trials have need to be appropriate. Need to be appropriately designed, actually. And with a robust medication like this one, right? With a robust medication. Yeah. Okay, so I really like to thank you very much for Not at all. for enlightening us on on, on on the results of the Palisade and also this very complex situation that that we deal. Uh, and, and and I think in the end, the, the patients are going to benefit the most from from these therapies. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Gerald. Not at all. Pleasure, pleasure as, as always.